Yeah, so we have a university research chair in interactive documentary filmmaking. So I think it's important to just highlight at the beginning that this presentation is about an actual project, so to speak, but the project has been used as a foil to try variations of research into the VR space. And so it's never been prioritized to deliver a completed thing, but to keep monkeying around and figuring out the relationship to, between documentary filmmaking, the linear sense. I'm a verite documentary filmmaker. Uh, you can see the gray hair, uh, decades of uh, this tradition burnt into me, and mentally, spiritually, uh, socially, and trying to move into these other spaces, these new literacies. Um, so Verites, you know, for me, it's always been about time on location. And uh, the, you know, the, my, my objective is the first person lived experience as the expert. That's how we go after getting uh, the films made, the information, the sensual, the sensual elements of it. It's based on spending lots of time on location with minimal gear accessible, accessible approaches, natural light, freedom of movement, and sharing the tools of production. So for like in spit, squeegee punks and tap traffic, we gave away cameras to the, to the squeegee punks and they, they co-directed the film with uh, me at I Still Film. And there's a certain chaos and all that, but there's a certain you know, learning of, of variations of voices, perspectives, and also how the tools are used creatively. Um, Marco uh, joined with me and we developed a thing called Homeless Nation. Homeless Nation was a website uh, created based on these other films that I had made, The Street of Film with the Homeless and uh, Spit, Squeegee Punks in Traffic, where we wanted to find more effective ways with digital media to give direct voice to the subjects, to the participants. So we opened up street level uh, laboratories at shelters across the country and did some education and put tools out into the hands and they got some literacy and they started making their own profile pages where they, where they, where they put up their own content, their own art, their own voice. Everybody had their own voice. No. Uh, third party projects were ever made with this material. It was always material directly presented by, by the uh, subjects in their way and it stayed that way. Uh, it was sort of important. And what we really learned from that and which we've always tried to continue on is that self-expression builds self-esteem and it's another key kind of corner post in what was always at this time this verite practice. So then I got some money to make another film and it was a film called I Am The Blues. And so I shot this film and as part of getting the Canada Media Fund, the, the POV uh, grant, which is a core grant to make documentaries in Canada, I was uh, expected after the film was done to deliver a digital media companion piece, which was uh, kind of complicated to know exactly what I would do. So definitely went to Marco and asked Marco to help me figure out what could we do because we had already shot, we were already back home from location and how we were gonna proceed. And at the same time as that is when the research chair and interactive documentary began. So we thought this plateau of material we have and this challenge we have could be a key learning resource to uh, support students participating and learning the various techniques and you know elements because I work at the school of cinema so I'm not really working with like coders uh VR people I'm I'm working in a traditional documentary or traditional cinematic process so uh Marco feel free to proceed thank you yeah uh so uh what happened there is that uh, we had this uh, th this uh, mandate of doing this uh, digital media companion. So, at, at first we created this uh, a web a interface web, web a version of the Blues VR when you can navigate inside the Blues Front Cafe. It was a web gel a experience, a three D experience, and and what happened then was that. Um, we had uh, three elements happening. We had, of course, the 3D models from the WebGL experience plus the Unity project. So we have uh, something to start, uh, uh, some, some uh, tangible elements to start with. 
also we have many, many hours of 2D uh, video footage from the film. And we also had the, the, the research happenings, this was going on. So it was, uh, at that time it was like, okay, so we have all these elements, we have uh, also students at, at our disposal. So uh, let's make a, a version of, a, a VR version of, uh, of Blues. Um, how hard can this be actually? <laughs> and, and that is that, that was certainly the first, uh, a, um, a step of the journey. So we, we started looking at uh, what type of VR experience we wanted. And at, at that moment we started, uh, we started looking at 360 degree videos with uh, three degrees of freedom. Uh, and also we look at, of course, high immersion VR with six degrees of freedom. Uh, one of the elements that uh, when we started to look at both options is, was that in 360 degree video, the quality, we had some issues with the quality of the image. And you can see that the echo rectangular video had like a full resolution. You can have a 2K, 6K image, but suddenly what people were watching, so the output of that image was actually really a portion of it. So there was a degradation of the image in happening. Um, Dan, I remember um, we had some issues with students. Yeah, I mean, on uh, again, in the spirit of this being a learning uh, process with the students, uh, what what was happening, some of the things that were happening was one, we were now working with a model. We modeled the Blue Front Cafe. It was no longer this filmed Blue Front Cafe with characters in it. And we were trying to figure out how to work with this model, which was something that was new and different. And the cinema students who is who originally worked on these projects with me, because that's where I teach, were not interested in three six. 360 degree cinema. They found the resolution, the reproduction, the, the projection capabilities, just not of high enough quality. They were used to shooting in 4K, 8K, having beautiful projection capabilities. And I lost their interest. They weren't interested in like the camera can't really move. It has to have the point of view of like the, the, the viewer's point of view as in like a certain height to match their eyes to avoid nausea and dizziness. And I just had very minimal uh, participation and uh, people were leaving. And interestingly enough, we started getting more connect with like computational arts and design people, animation people, people that were more into completely other levels of uh, other areas of let's say uh, media production. But that was a challenge for sure. That, that was, yes, that was a challenge. And so, so, so what happens is that we finally said, no, we're not going this path. And we decided that we're going to go uh, for a high immersion VR experience, six degrees of freedom. And then, of course, because we're documentarians and we did a doc uh, documentary film that we're trying to bring in VR. So we have to deal with documentary conventions, but we had to blend them in also with interactivity. And in our case, it was more geared to uh, what we understood at that time was a gaming convention. Let's start looking at, at, at gaming conventions. So, so we started looking at how do we build an interactive uh, narrative in VR? We look at all these uh, uh, processes or, or, or these uh, structures of uh, interactive and narrative are there. We decide, okay, well, let's just go, let's do some sort of a fishbone narrative uh, on this on this uh, project. Uh, this is a journey uh, from the cut of inflation up to the Blue from Cafe, the most important region in Mississippi. So this is going to be a linear, a linear uh, 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 narrative. This is going to be linear, narrative, but we're going to have some moments, we're going to have like four moments where the, the, the user can actually, uh, has to do some action in order to uh, trigger the next part of the story. And during that process, he can decide of how much time he can spend on the triggering the action. And depending on the space they are, they can actually get some information around and and and, and get more uh, a kind of build an, an additional narrative for that. So so what we did, we started to build this um, a kind of a storyboards. Blue filmmaker was used to that. So with storyboards, and we went to this big uh, a flow chart. And 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 then a one of the the elements, and I think Dan, you you remember you you was you were telling me about uh, how we script live like, uh, on documentary filmmaking. Well, I mean, again, all this is like learning curve. I'm remembering when we were doing these fish bone linear narrative, concentric narrative, parallel narrative, branching narrative, thread of threaded narratives. Uh, 
for that uh, possibilities of how to design a VR. We were actually trying to teach that at the film school in a special topics course to, to students who were not used to looking at the world in, 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 in these VR or non-linear ways. Storytelling traditionally is linear. When we document a life, it has a beginning, a middle, and end. It's kind of a perfect linear arc or you know, with a little bit of conflict and a conclusion. And so deconstructing all of this stuff is challenging everything that we know and everything that we assume. And we're starting to, so we go to Milieu. And if you go to Milieu at Concordia in the EV building, it's dominated by TAG. And TAG is dominated by a gaming spirit. And now it's like, we're trying to use some of this VR equipment and the literacy is really coming from gaming. It's not coming from cinema. And we're being told, and we're being told really to be blunt, mm -hmm. there's no shot, there's no frame, uh, there's, no, there's no place for 2D. Uh, you know, there's no place for these conventions that you're bringing from your, your history, 100 years of history uh, into the space. And so I'm immediately like, whoa, no, that can't be true because what I know and what I've learned has to be of relevance of some kind of merit. And so I'm going to try to construct in that stubborn way, driving Marco crazy to do all these elements and see what happens, what happens, including 2D. What happens sticking, like trying to create a linear arc to our VR? What happens if we think of things as shots or as projections? And, and Marco will probably tell you about some of them now. <laughs> so what, what happened was that what, what we, we got into this uh, dilemma versus photography versus modeling, like 2D footage uh, into 3D environment. And that was like a whole, uh, uh, the, like the first uh, step of a journey. So, okay, so uh, what we have, um, um, we have a film and then we have we, or we have this new space, the new medium. And are we doing a translation? Are we taking a, a moments on the film and then we are trying to replicate them uh, uh, on this VR piece, what you see in there were the assets coming from the WebGL experience, the desktop experience. And, and at one point when we started to look at that, okay, we took these assets, but of, wait a minute, if you start walking around them, they're flat, there's a flatness there, they don't, they don't match uh, the space. And uh, as Dan was, uh, uh, was mentioning earlier, we got um, already challenged uh, by uh, this other a, a type of artists that say, you know, you know what, you have to work with 3D, uh, uh, we have to work with volume, you have to do with 3D images. So, so let's start modeling. So we start looking at this character representation element. So we have, we, we spend a lot, lot, lot of time and a lot of energy with the students trying to create these models, these animations, and trying to achieve, uh, uh, we, we, uh, we work with actually animators at Concordia also trying to get artistic, uh, stylish representation of a character. And, and, and we went even farther. We went even like, okay, so we have the character, but let's try to add motion. So we start playing around with the Rika character animation, texture mapping, 3D mapping into the characters. So we really went crazy on trying to really see if the modeling part was part of something that a, a, would, would could actually integrate on this project. Um, and then- and I uh, just, just, can I jump in there, Marco? I think ahead, it's just important. I think it's just important to highlight that, you know, this is coming from uh, student-led research at the university. So we have no, no real money to speak of. We don't have very advanced equipment. Uh, we're not, we don't even have 360 footage of this blues world we're trying to create because we can't go back and actually film in other cameras. We just have the rushes and then we start doing the modeling and the exploration. It's very grassroots and very uh, learning curve uh, centric. I just wanted to say that so they don't think we're like uh, some venture capital startup. <laughs> uh, but yeah, uh, you're right. And and uh, here's here's the thing. Okay, this is I guess this this was a breaking point. We were actually trying to compare what we achieved uh, with the modeling and and the artistic rendering, and then we start looking back at at our our images and and the and and the cinematographic uh, element of it, and the wrinkles on the eyes and their faces and the expression. 
and 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 the ethics related to just taking that image, uh, appropriating that uh, this character, and making. Uh, uh, and I remember Dan saying all the time in, in in the lab saying this this looks like a Mario or a Mario Bros or Luigi character, and and that. Wow. And that <laughs> well, for me, this was like I I was a, 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 a it it caused a stop or a rupture. Yeah. I wasn't able ethically to see the characters as filmed in the verite, I call it the verite process and the documentary process to be somehow maybe, maybe partly because of our amateur status that we ended up ca characters becoming caricature, Bobby Rush looking like Luigi, so to speak. Um, uh, some kind of like, uh, you know, like more like a gaming model approach you know, like a Zelda world or something that just didn't uh, carry over what was the intentions uh, at the beginning of, of of using can we use VR and can we use some of these elements and still deliver some of the elements of documentary and one of the key elements of documentary for me was to introduce to the viewer I don't know if it could be introduced to a user but introduce to the viewer the voice and the community of others who are usually negative, negative corporate media negatively stereotyped. And by giving that voice and image and all the grammar and all the grammar of cinema, trying to break that down and create a more intimate relationship between the viewer and the characters and break down some of these negative stereotypes and build a better world. And I just didn't see that at this point uh, happening at all. Uh, so so yeah we we had to actually go back we have to like take the go back to the idea of we're going to use it to the images and then what we created in this world we started to create some sort of collage between the 3d model and the uh, the video we treat them with the rotoscope with a lot of treatment on the video image just to make sure that it became part of this a uh, a space that we were building uh, some sort of a like a not it's not like a full uh, photographic reality it was more like a an interpretation of this uh, blue space um, a, and one of the first uh, thing that happened when I'm showing you the some a a, a part of the project, some uh, shots, was that uh, we we managed to integrate them both. We had that integration, so okay, great. Now we have our character inside the project. He's talking to us, he's looking at us, but then we moved to this other issue. We was, how do we move the person in the environment? And are they actually listening <laughs> to our characters' information retention? And uh, it was actually so. So I wanted to show you this because this this was the image that that came out with uh, Oculus HTC the HTC Vive like a job simulator and everyone can actually grab things, be crazy around. There was this frenetic element of I can manipulate everything and I can do anything inside of your world, and and we. We kind of sort of went that way at the beginning. So we have this experience where people can grab elements on the project, can actually uh, interact, even grab a glass of water. But we found something that was kind of like a playing against our intention, which a uh, which uh, you can actually can tell I just us and jump uh, in. Go ahead. Sorry, sorry to be interrupting. It's just uh. the way we're organized. It's it it I. So we needed movement uh -huh. because the thing about Verite documentary is that it has freedom of movement. We don't use tripods. We don't, we don't use lights. So therefore we can move around, we can move around in a location freely. Handheld, we take a lot of care in that and to show intimate details in an environment, in a location by paying attention to natural light and not having to cut action, cut action, keep, not bother the characters, but still be able to show other details in the location that add emotion and sensuality to the intellectual that's, you know, the voice is often doing in, in the dialogue. So we're building this environment in this way. And it's like, I can't go into VR in a 360 world like this and somehow the viewer can't move around so we go crazy trying to create variations of ways for them to have freedom of movement mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Okay, so thank you, and, 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 and yeah, and, and that's interesting because we did different iterations. We actually started with a free teleportation point. Then we, we went for point teleportation. There was, uh, uh, then we said, you know what? We went really back and we started to play with eye gaze teleportation and say, just you're sitting, you're looking and then you move there. Uh, but then what happened was that it, it doesn't matter every, every decision that we made, we still had this frenzy of trying to move around and trying to like losing, losing focus. And so we decided to go another way. So we signed the, the, the structure. So this is a, this is, this is one scene of a, one, 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 one uh, scene of the project where we put a, put the, 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 the user inside a, a train, a wagon, and, and he's just there standing. So everything is passing through a, on him it's like and 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 then we realize that they now they're looking now they're walking now they're looking around the room but they're paying attention they're just just focusing where they were because there is no we have taken the frenzy of where should i go next what what and and that that was an, an interesting kind of um discovery said so, okay we, we 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 have to make this process he, he can just just stand Look around, still interact with the environment, but it's it's we're more guiding. Uh, we have to guide the the, the motion. Uh, and in addition to that, we got the fact that uh, we have characters talking to you. So people, the, these characters are revealing their stories. And one of the elements that uh, also we noticed uh, during these uh, iterations of the project was that people were not remembered. There, there, there was no retention of what was said. And, and that therefore the, our question was if the narrative impact was diminished by just expense of more inter freedom of movement, all this interaction happening. So um, um, I'm gonna jump in for a second here, Marco. Yeah. <laughs> so like when Marco's explaining all the different uh, forms of movement, the teleportation or the eye gaze or this or that, this wasn't really a problem for us in, in the, and the working models, because we we that was the the goal was to do all these different working models to see what would work, what wouldn't work, the exploration as research for students to participate in. And so, you know, as a result, we move very slowly and we and we don't come to conclusions very easily. But we still have our key goalposts. And and, th and at this moment, is if 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 you make the the user more interactive through movement and touching, clicking on things. And from my observation, it seems to me that the user at this point has very little new literacy because they have very limited access to VR, to headsets. They don't quite know what they're doing when they're in there and they just get hyper. Maybe they feel insecure and they, they, I think they kick back to the most uh, literate experience that we have, which is gaming, and they start wanting to touch everything. And so if we give them uh, like a control paddle or whatever, they're clicking on the doorknob, they're clicking on this, they're clicking, they're really not listening or retaining the information that we're trying to deliver. And this is a big conflict for a documentary process because we're trying to deliver information to the viewer, we're not trying to deliver information to the user how best to kind of navigate their own, I don't know, individual objectives to finish mm -hmm. getting to the end, so to speak. Exactly. They're both required. And, and and that is interesting because what happened then is when we took this piece, uh, one of the iteration of this piece, and we took it to uh, iDocs in Bristol a couple of years ago, and we got a this uh, video, so this reaction. So suddenly one a player uh, kind of uh, went along with a blues musician and, and started to feel the spirit that we were trying to convey on this on this project. Um, and was actually, I, I, I will argue, and I don't know if you agree with me Dan on that, but it was actually more led by the blues piece itself rather than that, the, the story that they told in front of him. Well, yeah, I think uh, the music uh, works in VR, but I'm not sure that character discourse of a documentary linear kind of desire that we came in of, of them telling their stories does work if you're going to let them exploit the, you know, the freedom of movement, the 360 world, et cetera, et cetera.
So, uh, so yeah. So uh, just to say that the piece, we, we still, we, we're in the last iteration of this piece. Uh, we have some, uh, we have had some discoveries and a, a kind of a aha moments. Uh, and we have some takeouts of this. Uh, I don't know, Dan, if you want to... Uh... Well, I mean, the conflict points are really, is it a viewer mm -hmm. or a user? Mm -hmm. uh, like when you come from documentary, these terms are, are huge. We want interaction and we want immersion. I mean, in, in, in any, in any uh, way that we're working, but mm -hmm. we also want information to be retained and for people to have a certain level of patience in the environment they're in to, to show uh, a, a certain care and concern to the characters, if we call them that, that are speaking in the environment. So if people are all hyper and obsessed with their own positioning, then there's a disconnect there that is definitely of concern. And I would say also character fidelity and how you deliver that at the moment is a question because when you're filming 80 year old blues musicians, their lives are etched on the wrinkles of their faces, their beautiful faces that have gone through the whole social civil rights movement, social justice movements. And if you gamify them to coin that phrase into caricature, that's, that that's not acceptable. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, I guess uh, that's uh, that's what we. Well, I mean, just quickly to... moving forward, we oh, now yes. know, with the help of Allison and other people in the labs, that if we were to do it again, we would do it completely different. We would take a volumetric video camera on location, mm -hmm. and we would we would record record things properly. We would understand that a lot of the tenets of Verite documentary filmmaking don't work. You can't have that kind of camera movement. You, you've got to pay more attention. It's a little more formal like fiction filmmaking where you cut and you frame things professionally. And that's that, that we probably went at this with the most largest amount of just in, in, innate conflicts possible. And that most of the things that I was doing in a Verite style are just things you're not supposed to do. If you're if you're trying to do things in VR, but it was interesting to explore it and and learn. Exactly. 